Welcome to Washington Today on C-SPAN Radio for Tuesday, June 11, 2024. A jury finds Hunter Biden, son of President Joe Biden, guilty on all three federal charges related to laws designed to keep drug addicts from owning firearms. President Biden putting out a statement, I will accept the outcome of this case and will continue to respect the judicial process as Hunter considers an appeal. House Republicans take another step towards holding Attorney General Merrick Garland in contempt of Congress for not handing over the audio of President Biden's interview with the special counsel in his classified documents case, bringing the resolution before the Rules Committee, which will set the rules for debate and votes this week on the House floor. Former New York Governor Andrew Cuomo is questioned before the House Coronavirus Subcommittee about his state's handling of COVID-19 and nursing homes. First, the mandate that nursing homes accept patients who test positive, and then later it's alleged underreporting nursing home deaths. A new proposed Biden administration rule would ban a person's medical debt from being part of one's credit report. Secretary of State Antony Blinken in Israel says Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu told him that Israel has agreed to the latest ceasefire and hostage release plan with Hamas, and now Hamas must give its okay. And the U.S. Coast Guard Commandant Admiral Linda Fagan testifies before a Senate subcommittee about allegations the Coast Guard Academy mishandled sexual assault investigations. From NBC News out of Wilmington, Delaware, a jury on Tuesday found Hunter Biden, the son of President Joe Biden, guilty on three felony gun charges after a week-long trial that focused on his bribery and drug addiction. Hunter Biden was charged in federal court with three felony counts tied to possession of a gun while using narcotics and had pleaded not guilty. The jury started its deliberations on Monday afternoon and deliberated for about three hours before returning the historic verdict. Hunter Biden looked straight ahead at the jury as it delivered the verdict and slightly nodded as it was read. First Lady Jill Biden was not in the courtroom as the verdict was read and arrived at the courthouse minutes later. She immediately went into a holding room where Hunter Biden went after the verdict. That was reporting from NBC News. The special counsel, David Weiss, later made a statement to the press. Earlier today, Hunter Biden was convicted of two counts of lying on a form submitted to a federal firearms dealer about his addiction or use of crack cocaine and possessing a firearm while a user or addict. There have been two overarching themes emphasized by the prosecution during trial, this defendant's illegal choices and the rule of law. First, while there has been much testimony about the defendant's abuse of drugs and alcohol, ultimately, this case was not just about addiction, a disease that haunts families across the United States, including Hunter Biden's family. This case was about the illegal choices defendant made while in the throes of addiction, his choice to lie on a government form when he bought a gun and the choice to then possess that gun. It was these choices and the combination of guns and drugs that made his conduct dangerous. Second, no one in this country is above the law. Everyone must be accountable for their actions, even this defendant. However, Hunter Biden should be no more accountable than any other citizen convicted of this same conduct. The prosecution has been and will continue to be committed to this principle and to the principles of federal prosecution in carrying out its responsibilities. I want to thank the jury for their service. There are few civic responsibilities more important than jury service. Fifteen Delawareans came to court each day and performed their responsibilities in a professional and conscientious manner. We thank them. I want to thank Derek Hines, Leo Wise, and the entire special counsel team. I am so proud of this group of attorneys, agents, and litigation professionals. This is a difficult assignment. These folks have been working seven days a week for the last couple months, litigating a variety of issues in district and appellate courts on two coasts. They have given their heart and soul to this work. They represent the best that public service has to offer. I am incredibly grateful. Finally, I want to thank Attorney General Garland for providing the support necessary to fulfill our mission, ensuring that we have the independence 
to appropriately pursue our investigations and prosecutions. As you know, we have additional trials and investigative work to be done. So I will not entertain questions at this time. Our work continues. Thank you for your consideration. Special Counsel David Weiss in Wilmington, Delaware. Back to the NBC News article. Two of the counts against Hunter Biden carry maximum prison sentences of 10 years, while a third has a maximum of five years. Under federal sentencing guideline recommendations, he could be sentenced to over a year in prison, but the judge could sentence him to more or less time. Each count also carries a maximum fine of $250,000. No sentencing date has been set. Hunter Biden putting out a statement after the verdict. I am more grateful today for the love and support I experienced this last week from Melissa, his wife, my family, my friends, and my community than I am disappointed by the outcome. Recovery is possible by the grace of God, and I am blessed to experience that gift one day at a time. And President Biden with a statement that reads, as I said last week, I am the president, but I am also a dad. Jill and I love our son, and we are so proud of the man he is today. So many families who have had loved ones battle addiction understand the feeling of pride seeing someone you love come out the other side and be so strong and resilient in recovery. As I also said last week, I will accept the outcome of this case and will continue to respect the judicial process as Hunter considers an appeal. Jill and I will always be there for Hunter and the rest of our family with our love and support. Nothing will ever change that. That was a statement from President Biden. Some reaction on Capitol Hill to the Hunter Biden verdict. Congresswoman Marionette Miller Meeks, Republican from Iowa. I think uh, for uh, those of us who saw the sweetheart plea deal that had uh, originally been uh, put forth uh, with the Department of Justice uh, and uh, 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 local individuals, that that fell apart because a judge uh, did their uh, job and looked thoroughly at that to see this now come about. Uh, you know, average ordinary people uh, would would already be in jail for these types of charges. So I think it's reassuring to see the criminal justice system work. Uh, for those of us who saw the suppression of the Hunter Biden laptop, of stories related to Hunter Biden prior to the election in 2020, uh, we think that this is a long day in coming. Uh, and so I think that, uh, you know, we'll see how this plays out. But I will also tell you that I have you know, great empathy for the Biden family, anybody who is a child. I have children of my own. Anybody who has children, uh, this is devastating to them. But uh, there are consequences uh, to uh, criminal behavior and actions. uh, And uh, you can't protect your your children from all those consequences, especially when they're adults making those decisions. And, you know, uh, the sweetheart deal smacked of corruption. uh, And I think that uh, people are reassured to see that the criminal justice system has played out uh, with this conclusion. Uh, I think that uh, if you look at uh, the uh, uh, President Trump's trial in New York uh, and the machinations that were done to take what would be a misdemeanor, what would be a business dealing, what Hillary Clinton had done uh, in uh, paying for the still docu- uh, dossier under uh, legal, uh, uh, you know, uh, legal proceedings, uh, that uh, uh, it was a trial that I think uh, you had to bend yourself into pretzel to find out in uh, the uh, the um, judges. Uh, instructions to the jury that they didn't have to have a uh, connected, uh, a connected um, um, a charge, but that they could find the president guilty on any of the charges, uh, and that would suffice. I think when you look at that, uh, there are grave concerns over the criminal justice system in that case, and I think ultimately it will be decided at the Supreme Court. Congresswoman Marionette Miller Meeks, Republican from Iowa, speaking to reporters on Capitol Hill. Speaker Mike Johnson, Republican from Louisiana. Posting on X, a year ago, Hunter Biden was offered a sweetheart deal that would have allowed him to bypass the justice system on these charges. Because whistleblowers spoke out and House Republicans sounded the alarm, Hunter was brought to court. Today, he was found guilty of all charges. Now it's time for DOJ to investigate the millions of dollars in payouts from foreign countries looking to curry favor with his father. We will continue to demand accountability for the corrupt business dealings of the Biden family. That was a statement from Speaker Mike Johnson. Congressman James McGovern, Democrat from Massachusetts, spoke about the Hunter Biden trial guilty verdict during a Rules Committee hearing today. He is the ranking member. Apparently, when a Republican is convicted, it's weaponization. But when a Democrat is convicted, the president's son, no less, that's justice. 
I mean, give me a break. Hunter Biden was found guilty by a jury of his peers, just like Donald Trump, because this is our justice system at work. The divide here is stunning, and it's a great reminder that one political party remains committed to the rule of law, and the other doesn't. It's that simple. Did Hunter Biden walk out of the courthouse this morning and slam the judge or the prosecutors? Did he claim some vast conspiracy to weaponize the legal system against him? No, he did not. In a statement on the verdict, President Biden said, and I quote, I will accept the outcome of this case and will continue to respect the judicial process, end quote. Now I ask, after the verdict this morning, how can rep any Republican in their right mind argue that the Biden administration is weaponizing the DOJ to hurt Republicans and to help Democrats? They just convicted the president's own son. To say nothing of the fact that the Department of Justice is currently trying a Democratic senator and has indicted a Democratic member of this House. I mean, do Republicans still believe that President Biden is weaponizing the justice system? Because if he is, he's sure doing a lousy job. And as usual, the only Trump derangement syndrome going on around here um, is on the other side of the aisle. I mean, people are saying that Biden uh, orchestrated the conviction of his own son in order to justify the criminal charges against Trump. That is how you think when you are in a cult. <laughs> Uh, so here's the bottom line. Republicans just can't wrap their heads around the idea that their presidential candidate, your presumptive nominee, is a convicted felon. That is not the result of a sham process or some vast conspiracy by the Biden administration. That is the result of the truth. And these attacks on our justice system have to come to a stop. They are dangerous. They are irresponsible. They are nothing but false conspiracy theories being mm. pushed to try and excuse the actions of the former president, and they are made even more absurd by the outcome of the trial this morning in Delaware. Congressman James McGovern, Democrat from Massachusetts, at today's Rules Committee hearing. It, the hearing was on a different subject, different legal matter, whether to hold the attorney general in contempt for not turning over the audio of President Biden's deposition in his classified documents case. We will get to that in a couple of minutes on Washington Today. Carolyn Levitt, the Donald Trump campaign national press secretary put out a statement about the Hunter Biden trial, saying the trial has been nothing more than a distraction from the real crimes of the Biden crime family, which has raked in tens of millions of dollars from China, Russia and Ukraine. Crooked Joe Biden's reign over the Biden family criminal empire is all coming to an end on November 5th. And never again will a Biden sell government access for personal profit. White House announced that President Joe Biden changed his schedule today to head home to Wilmington, Delaware, where his son Hunter was found guilty. And it was after his speech at a previously scheduled event in D.C. hosted by the group Every Town for Gun Safety called Gun Sense University that included gun violence survivors, volunteers and advocates there for training on organizing. After a school shooting in Iowa... I killed a student and a teacher. My predecessor was asked about it. You remember what he said. He said, have to get over it. Hell no, we don't have to get over it. We got to stop it. We got to stop it and stop it now. More children are killed in America by guns than cancer and car accidents combined. My predecessor told the NRA convention recently, he's proud that, quote, I did nothing on guns when I was president. And by doing nothing, he made the situation considerably worse. That's why every town, why this summit, why all of you here today are so damn important. We need you. We need you to overcome the unrelenting opposition of the gun lobby, gun manufacturers, so many politicians when they oppose common sense gun legislation. I used to be a law when I was no longer the vice president, I became a professor at the University of, of um, Pennsylvania. Before that, I taught a constitutional law class, and so I taught the, the Second Amendment. There's never been a time that says you can own anything you want. There never. You couldn't own a cannon during the Civil War. <laughs> no, I'm serious. Think about it. How many times have you heard this phrase? The blood of liberty. <laughs> Wash it, though. Give me a break. No, I mean it, seriously. And by the way, if they want to think to, is to take on government, if we get out of line, which they're talking again about, 
Well, guess what? They need F-15s. They don't need a rifle. <laughs> Folks, look, this is crazy what we're talking about. Because yeah. whether we're Democrats or Republicans, we want our, our families to be safe. Yeah. We all want to drop them off at a house of worship, a mall, a movie theater, a school, without worrying it's the last time I'm going to get to see them. Yeah. We all want. We all want our kids to have the freedom to learn how to read and write in schools instead of learn how to duck and cover, for God's sake. And above all, above all, we all agree, we are not finished. President Joe Biden at an anti-gun violence program hosted by the organization Every Town for Gun Safety. He again called for a ban on assault weapons and universal background checks for gun purchases. A resolution to hold Attorney General Merrick Garland in contempt of Congress for not complying with subpoena to turn over the audio of President Biden's interview with former Special Counsel Robert Hur in the classified documents investigation came before the House Rules Committee today. The committee will be setting the rules for debate for the House floor later this week. The Justice Department has given the Republican-led House committees that issued the subpoena a transcript of the president's interview, but has asserted executive privilege over the audio. Here's part of today's Rules Committee meeting. You'll hear from the chair, Michael Burgess, Republican from Texas, questioning two witnesses, Gerald Nadler, Democrat from New York, ranking member on the Judiciary Committee, and Harriet Hageman, Republican from Wyoming, a member of the Judiciary Committee. You said that Mr. Hur's comments when he related the, the, the status of, of this interview was that the, the, the president seemed well-meaning but confused. Now, the, I think, the, 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 and, and you said his, yourself, his, I, I you characterize I that. His, I think the American people deserve the report, opportunity to be able to hear that report, for themselves. People are smart. They can make that discernment on their own. His report made very clear that there were multiple reasons for not indicting Mr. Biden. His gratuitous comment about uh, Mr. No, Biden's... No, I'm sorry, we never read you. I'll, I'll give you a chance to respond, but your characterizing that as gratuitous is in and of itself gratuitous. I mean, you do not you get to that. have that. You can judge that. I don't think it's gratuitous. His comment was gratuitous because... If you read his report, that's not why the president, uh, the, the president was not indicted. There are ample reasons given in the report for not indicting the president. And given that, which, not including that, and given that fact, to, con, to, to make that observation was gratuitous. Well, why but, not uh, then clear the air and make the, tra- the, 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 the actual audio of the interview available. Let the American people be the deciders here. Because. Why hide that from them? Because. People are sensitive because they were told that, say, a certain laptop was Russian disinformation and 51 members of the intelligence community signed a letter to that effect. And then it turns out, well, maybe it was not. Because the chairman of the Judiciary Committee has already been caught altering. May I respond? No, not, not until I finish has been caught altering uh, 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 um, verbal uh, you know, electronic transcripts in the case of Nina Jankowitz. And we have every reason to believe, or uh, let, me, let me retract that. Yeah. We have no reason to believe that he wouldn't do so again. Yeah. If I may respond. That Please, is, I wish that, you would. That is absolutely untrue. Um, Jim, neither Jim Jordan nor anybody on the Judiciary Committee cha- made any changes to Nita Jankowitz's interview transcript. That's absolutely a false statement. There's one other point that I think needs to be clarified, which is that Special Counsel Robert Hur stated on page one of his report, our investigation uncovered evidence that President Biden willfully retained and disclosed classified materials after his vice presidency when he was a vice president. The reason that he recommended against prosecuting President Biden was not a gratuitous statement. It was the reason as to why he refused to recommend prosecution. And it was that because, because, because Joe Biden is a, quote, sympathetic, well-meaning elderly man with a poor memory, Mr. Hur was concerned that a jury would not be willing to convict. Anyone who wants to see what Mr. Hur actually found and his explanation of what he did 
You can go and you can watch the hearing before the Judiciary Committee. But one thing is very clear, and I will go back to it again. The, 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 the folks on the other side of the aisle keep wanting to say the transcript and the audio are identical. There is no reason why, if you have the transcript, you're entitled to the audio. As a long practicing attorney, they are not the same thing. The audio is the best evidence of what he said, how he said at the time that it took for him to say it, and in what ways they may have altered that transcript. The moment that they released the transcript and said this is the interview, they waived their ability to claim any kind of a privilege, and they don't have a legally valid privilege in addition to that. And it's for that reason that we believe that Merrick Garland needs to be held in contempt of Congress. I will well, agree, I with, I will American, agree with her. I, I will agree. General will suspend. I firmly believe that the American people are entitled to hear this. And uh, I'm grateful that you brought this today. I'll give you a chance to respond, Mr. Nadler, but then we need Ms. to move Hager. on to I Mr. I will agree with Ms. Hagerman that there is no evidence that the transcript was altered whatsoever. The transcript wasn't altered. But... In Ms. Hageman, I'm sorry, Ms. Jankowitz's case, the transcript wasn't altered, the video was altered. Yeah. And that's what we're concerned about. We're not arguing the Jankowitz case, we're arguing. No, but <laughs> if, if the Judiciary Committee the American people was deserve the ability enough, to see that and make if, this decision the on their own, they are sick and tired of being lied to if the, by agencies. If the Judiciary McGovern, Committee was dishonest enough, the leadership, to, 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 to uh, manipulate the video in the Jankowitz matter, it is dishonest enough to manipulate the video in this matter, and that is a good reason to withhold it. Congressman Gerald Nadler, Democrat from New York, testifying before the House Rules Committee, also testifying, Congresswoman Harriet Hageman, Republican from Wyoming, and you heard the chair of the Rules Committee, Congressman Michael Burgess, Republican from Texas. A Politico article reads that both the Judiciary and Oversight Panels advanced contempt resolutions last month against the Attorney General Merrick Garland, but floor votes were delayed as Republicans figured out if they had the votes. If the Rules Committee reports a rule, it could come to the floor this week, setting up debate on the resolution holding the Attorney General in contempt. Story from CBS News, former New York Governor Andrew Cuomo's handling of COVID in nursing homes is under scrutiny today in Washington, D.C. Republican lawmakers on the House Select Subcommittee on the Coronavirus Pandemic are specifically asking him about the state's nursing home guidance in the early days of the pandemic. On March 25, 2020, New York mandated that nursing homes must admit patients who tested positive for COVID. Cuomo's administration was later accused of underreporting nursing home deaths. But the state acknowledged at least 15,000 long-term care residents died during the pandemic. That was from CBS News. Andrew Cuomo spoke to reporters as he arrived on Capitol Hill for the closed-door testimony. Any remorse? Look, the, uh, all across the nation, the nursing homes were the places of tremendous tragedy and loss. Uh, at one time in this country, 50% of the deaths were in nursing homes. Uh, so it was a national tragedy. And that's what we have to learn from. Again, New York performed very well, given the circumstances, that we should be number 39, which means only 11 states had, uh, only 11 states had a lower pro rata death in nursing homes. If you had said that to me in year one of COVID, when we had the highest infection rate in the nation, when we didn't know what hit us, and it turns out that we're number 39, only 11 states had a higher pro rata death. It just vindicates everything New Yorkers did. They isolated, they followed the science, the first responders were masterful, and that's what the facts show. Forget the political spin. Hey guys, uh, these are facts. You also undercounted, you also undercounted the deaths. Did that have anything to do with your book? Former New York Governor Andrew Cuomo, Democrat, arriving on Capitol Hill this morning for the closed-door testimony before the House Select Subcommittee on the Coronavirus Pandemic, that audio posted by The Recount. Congressman Mark Molinaro, Republican from New York, who was part of today's session, spoke to reporters outside the committee room. What was breathtaking uh, was that the governor uh, asserts that he didn't know the, uh, the detail of the health department order that nursing homes themselves could decline readmission and that he hadn't heard from any nursing homes complaining about the 
the, the rigidity of that order, none of that can be true. Um, either, either, he, um, either he was totally divorced from the day-to-day operations of state government, or he's lying. I suggest he's lying. Um, keep in mind, at the time, the state legislature grant uh, this was unique in, in the country. The state legislature granted the governor of New York the capacity to create law. They, they ceded their authority to the governor of New York, and he could write, by executive order, new law. So that order was seen as law by nursing homes. Those nursing homes complained. He, he organized control rooms, meetings uh, among public officials in each region of the state. At every one of those meetings, we communi- I communicated personally the concern that nursing homes had. That process would have reported up to the governor's office. Either these were fundamentally uh, uh, window dressing, which of course they were to a degree, um, or again, he's lying. I suggest he's lying. Do you, did he say who wrote this order? Oh. Because that's never, never been very clear. Was it somebody in his executive office? Um, I'll let, he, he asserts he, he didn't write it and that Dr. Zucker didn't write it. Now, I think that knowing the governor as I do, what he's suggesting is he didn't actually type it. <laughs> but there is little question that the commissioner of health and the governor of New York knew the order. They want to assert that that order is exactly the same as the federal CMS order, which it is not. The state order says you shall, you shall take back individuals, and you cannot deny them solely on the basis of COVID, which left them no option but to accept individuals that we knew would cause risk to the other other patients. So he's now saying, so do I, do I, have to I don't know if it's now saying. I haven't heard his you know, regurgitation of this nonsense for quite a while. From what I understand yeah. what you just said is that he's saying that nursing homes could have said no yes. to these COVID patients. Then why does he keep saying, I guess, that um, that this was all coming from the federal government, that this was all federal guidance and they were just doing whatever the federal government Andrew Cuomo is attempting to shift blame for what was a clear directive. The clear directive was from the governor who was allowed to create law and exercise extreme executive authority, unlike any governor in the country, he, he wants to shift the blame to the federal government. The governor maintained at the time that nursing homes could not say no, that the order was very clear, and that, uh, uh, and, and, and then subsequently, when they, when they identified and knew that the order was causing great loss, uh, they subsequently cooked the books to suggest that the numbers of, of those who died in nursing homes were much less than, than we knew was, was accurate. Congressman Mark Molinaro, Republican from New York, outside the coronavirus pandemic subcommittee meeting that heard from a former governor of New York, Democrat Andrew Cuomo. By the way, back in 2018, the two ran against each other. Governor Cuomo won. A New York Post article reads, the Justice Department did not recommend Cuomo for prosecution based on the March 25th, 2020 must-admit order after looking into the decision. But reports From the New York Bar Association, the Empire Center for Public Policy determined that it led to hundreds of additional deaths. And New York Attorney General Letitia James also revealed in January 2021, at the end of an investigation, that the Cuomo administration undercounted by more than 50 percent the number of nursing home deaths. That was from the New York Post. Washington Today continues in a moment. The House will be in order. This year, C-SPAN celebrates 45 years of covering Congress like no other. Since 1979, we've been your primary source for Capitol Hill, providing balanced, unfiltered coverage of government, taking you to where the policies debated and decided, all with the support of America's cable companies. C-SPAN, 45 years and counting, powered by cable. Welcome back to Washington Today, available as a podcast on the C-SPAN Now mobile app, which is free and wherever you find your podcasts. From BBC News, U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken has said Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu has reaffirmed his commitment to a Gaza ceasefire plan and that if it does not progress, Hamas will be to blame. Mr. Blinken reiterated his call for Hamas to accept the plan as outlined by President Biden 11 days ago. He was speaking a day after holding talks with Mr. Netanyahu in Jerusalem. He said the onus was on one guy hiding 10 stories underground in Gaza to make the casting vote, referring to Hamas leader Yahya Sinwar. 
Mr. Netanyahu has not publicly endorsed what Mr. Biden outlined, nor said whether it matches an Israeli ceasefire proposal on which Mr. Biden's statement was based. That was from BBC News. Secretary Blinken spoke to reporters in Tel Aviv today after meeting with families of hostages held by Hamas and other groups. All of the hostages, but especially our eight American families who have loved ones in Gaza, we are determined to bring them home. The proposal that President Biden put forward is the best way to do that. And I think, as I said uh, just uh, yesterday, you've had country after country make that clear in supporting the proposal. And then yesterday, the United Nations Security Council, in effect speaking for the entire international community, made it as clear as it possibly could be that this is what the world is looking for. Uh, 14 votes for, no votes against, something quite rare uh, at the Security Council these days, and I think that speaks volumes too. So everyone's vote is in except for one vote, and that's Hamas, and that's what we wait for. Um, it is on Hamas to move forward with this proposal or, or not. Secretary of State Antony Blinken in Tel Aviv, Israel. A reporter asked him about Prime Minister Netanyahu's support for the ceasefire plan and also reported disagreements between Israel and Hamas about a part of the proposal that would result in a permanent ceasefire. So just to follow up on what you said about your meeting with the prime minister, uh, did you get an explicit assurance that he would, if Hamas accepts the proposal that's on the table, that the deal is done, that he reciprocally or he continues his support for it, that yes. that, will, that will clinch things? Yes. And can you just tell us, related to that, how do you reconcile what seems to be a difference between the Hamas position that there has to be an Israeli assurance of a permanent ceasefire as part of this process in phase two, I guess, uh, and the prime minister's statement that uh, talk of a permanent ceasefire is a total non-starter. That seems like an irreconcilable difference. How do you see that being solved? Well, first, what the proposal does is it brings an immediate ceasefire, and it commits the parties to uh, negotiate an enduring ceasefire. Uh, and that will be the, a, a process of negotiations, but the commitment in agreeing to the proposal is to, um, to seek that uh, enduring ceasefire, uh, but that, uh, that has to be negotiated. As long as those negotiations are, are ongoing, the ceasefire that would take place immediately uh, would, uh, would remain in place, which is manifestly good for, uh, for everyone, and then we'll have to see. But you're not going to get to phase two to uh, an enduring ceasefire unless you start with phase one. So. That's where it begins. Secretary of State Antony Blinken in Tel Aviv, Israel, during a short news conference. Later in the day from Associated Press, Hamas says it has given Qatari and Egyptian mediators its reply to the U.S.-backed proposal for a ceasefire in Gaza with some, quote, remarks on the deal. Hamas and the smaller Islamic Jihad militant group said they were ready to deal positively to arrive at an agreement and that the priority is to bring a complete stop to the war. The foreign ministries of Qatar and Egypt said in a joint statement they were examining the response and that they would continue their mediation efforts along with the United States until an agreement is reached. That was from Associated Press. Secretary Blinken then went on to Jordan, where he attended emergency humanitarian aid conference, announcing more than $400 million in new aid for Palestinians in Gaza. He also said that only one-third of the current United Nations appeal is funded, and that leaves a shortfall of approximately 2 to $3 billion. He said every country can help fill the gap. It's some who express great concern over the suffering of the Palestinian people in Gaza, including countries with the capacity to give a lot, have provided very little or nothing at all. Story from the Jerusalem Post, the U.N. Human Rights Office said on Tuesday the killings of civilians in Gaza during the Israeli operation to free four hostages, as well as Palestinian armed groups holding of captives in densely populated areas, could amount to war crimes. The operation killed more than 270 Palestinians, according to Hamas-controlled Gazan health officials. That was reporting from Jerusalem Post. Jeremy Lawrence, a spokesperson for the U.N. office, spoke today in Geneva. We are profoundly shocked at the impact on civilians of the Israeli forces operation in Al Nazarat at the weekend to secure the release of four hostages. Hundreds of Palestinians, many of them civilians, were reportedly killed and injured. 
the manner in which the raid was conducted in such a densely populated area seriously calls into question whether the principles of distinction, proportionality and precaution as set out under the laws of war were respected by the Israeli forces. Our office is also deeply distressed that Palestinian armed groups continue to hold many hostages most of them civilians, which is prohibited by international humanitarian law. Furthermore, by holding hostages in such densely populated areas, the armed groups doing so are putting the lives of Palestinian civilians, as well as the hostages themselves, at added risk from the hostilities. All these actions by both parties may amount to war crimes. Jeremy Lawrence, a spokesperson for the Office of the United Nations High Commissioner for Human Rights, speaking today at the headquarters in Geneva, Switzerland. From the Jerusalem Post article, in response to the statement, Israelis' permanent mission to the United Nations in Geneva accused the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights of slandering Israel. The statement said the toll of this war on civilians is first and foremost the product of Hamas's deliberate strategy to maximize civilian harm. Story from Nikkei Asia news site. The group of seven leading industrialized nations will set up a fund to support Ukraine using some income generated from frozen Russian assets. Nikkei has learned the fund will be created under an international organization such as the World Bank with contributions in the form of extraordinary revenue acceleration loans. G7 leaders intend to announce the plan in a joint statement at their summit in Italy, which begins Thursday. The U.S. has indicated it will provide $50 billion, and the United Kingdom, Canada, and Japan will consider contributing as well. That's from Nikkei Asia. John Kirby, White House National Security Communications Advisor, talked about the G7 meeting and President Biden's attendance today during a virtual audio news conference. At the G7 meeting later this week, our commitment to Ukraine will continue to be right up front and clear. We will take bold steps to show Mr. Putin that time is not on his side and that he cannot outlast us as we support Ukraine's fight for freedom. First, we will announce new steps to unlock the value of the immobilized Russian sovereign assets to benefit Ukraine and to help them recover from the destruction that Mr. Putin's army has caused. On Thursday, President Biden and President Zelensky will sit down to discuss our strong support for Ukraine now and into the future. And following that meeting, both leaders, President Biden and President Zelensky, will participate in a news conference. Throughout the last two and a half years, we've also stood up uh, to Putin in other ways, imposing the strongest set of sanctions and export controls ever placed on a major economy, moving in lockstep to immobilize Russia's sovereign assets to deprive Putin's war machine of critical funding and to enforce a price cap on Russian oil. We're going to continue to drive up costs for the Russian war machine, and this week we will announce an impactful set of new sanctions and export control actions. These actions will follow through on several of the commitments that G7 leaders have made to date. The actions will target the entities and networks that are helping Russia procure what it needs for its war. They will make it harder for financial facilitators, for instance, to support Russia's defense industrial base. And they will further restrict Russia's future revenues in key sectors. White House spokesperson John Kirby in a virtual audio news conference today. The G7 nations are the United States, Japan, Canada, Germany, France, Italy, and Great Britain. And the European Union is also represented separately. A Reuters article about the agenda for the summit this week due to kick off on Thursday with a discussion about Africa, climate change, and development. The conversation then switches to the Middle East before two sessions dedicated to Ukraine. Day two has sessions on immigration, the Indo-Pacific, and economic security before the arrival in the afternoon of the outreach partners for talks on the Mediterranean, energy, and Africa. And Pope Francis will lead talks on artificial intelligence. This is Washington Today. Story from ABC News and a sweeping change that could improve millions of Americans' ability to own a home or buy a car. The Biden administration will propose a rule Tuesday to ban medical debt from credit reports. Consumer Financial Protection Bureau research estimates 
that the new rule will allow 22,000 more people to get approved for safe mortgages each year, meaning lenders could also benefit from the positive impact on people's credit scores by being able to approve more borrowers. That was from ABC News. Vice President Kamala Harris announced this in a teleconference. Today, more than 100 million Americans struggle with medical debt. Usually medical debt is the result of a medical emergency, an unplanned, unexpected expense, often of tens to hundreds of thousands of dollars. And one of the most significant consequences of carrying medical debt is the harm it does to a person's credit score. Medical debt makes it more difficult for millions of Americans to be approved for a car loan, a home loan, or a small business loan, all of which in turn makes it more difficult to just get by, much less get ahead. And that is simply not fair, especially when we know that people with medical debt are no less likely to repay a loan than those without medical debt. No one should be denied access to economic opportunity simply because they experienced a medical emergency. So today I'm proud to announce we will soon make it so that medical debt can no longer be included in your credit score. We are making it so that medical debt cannot be used against you when you apply for a car loan, a home loan, or a small business loan, or something of that nature. As a result of this change, millions of Americans will see an increase in their credit score on average of 20 points, which will mean every year an estimated 22,000 more American families will be approved for a mortgage and able to buy a home. Vice President Kamala Harris on a teleconference, also on the call, the head of the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, Rohit Chopra. Again, from the ABC News article, some major credit card companies have already stopped using medical debt to calculate people's credit worthiness, including Equifax, TransUnion, and Experian. FICO and Vantage Score also recently started factoring medical debt less heavily into their scores. But 15 million Americans still have $49 billion of medical debt that is hampering their scores, the CFPB found. The U.S. House today took a bill titled No Hidden Fees on Extra Expenses for Stays Act, or No Hidden Fees Act, that would require mandatory fees be included in the advertised prices of hotels, motels, inns, and privately owned vacation rentals. The sponsor, debating on the House floor, Congresswoman Young Kim, Republican of California. Hidden fees on short-term lodging stays, such as hotels, inns, resorts, make budgeting for a trip much harder for families who are already struggling from persistent inflation and rising living costs. Customers often find themselves paying more for their overnight stay than what was advertised online. And these unexpected, deceptive fees hurt families' bottom line. According to a 2023 Consumer Report survey, 37% of Americans found themselves paying an extra hidden fee, with more than half expressing that this additional cost took them over budget. The No Hidden Fees Act requires hotels, motels, and travel and lodging sites to disclose upfront the full cost of a short-term stay including all mandatory and resort fees. Currently, the way prices are advertised across the lodging industry is fragmented and not uniform. My bill would require all stakeholders in the lodging and booking industries and third-party distributors to clearly display the final price. This provides clarity for consumers and improves the quality of the American hospitality and tourism industries. So I want to thank Chairwoman Rogers from the Energy and Commerce uh, Committee for her leadership and to the rest of the House Energy and Commerce staff for their tireless work on this bipartisan and common sense legislation. And I want to thank Representative Castro for um, Um, Castor for making this a bipartisan bill. I also want to thank all the outside stakeholders and consumer advocacy groups who work with us on this pro-consumer initiative. Congresswoman Young Kim, Republican from California, on the House floor, and she was referring to Congresswoman Kathy Castor, Democrat of Florida. The bill was brought up under procedures known as suspension of the rules, which uses special 
debate and vote rules in place of the regular House rules. It includes no amendments allowed, but a two-thirds vote needed for passage rather than a simple majority. On Wall Street today, the Dow down 120, Nasdaq up 151, S&P up 14. Military Times reported on Monday ahead of a highly anticipated congressional hearing for Coast Guard leaders this week. A Coast Guard Academy official announced her resignation Sunday, alleging she was directed to lie and discourage sexual assault victims from coming forward. Shannon Norenberg, who served as the sexual assault response coordinator at the Coast Guard Academy since 2013, wrote in a blog post about her actions as part of the Coast Guard cover-up of a report known as Operation Fouled Anchor. The report detailed years of sexual assault and inaction at the U.S. Coast Guard Academy from the late 1980s to 2006, alleging instances of sexual misconduct by at least 43 Academy staff. That was from Military Times. The hearing was today. Senate Homeland Security and Governmental Affairs Subcommittee with testimony from Admiral Linda Fagan, Coast Guard Commandant, In her opening statement, she apologized and promised cooperation with ongoing investigations. Senator Richard Blumenthal, Democrat from Connecticut, the subcommittee chair, asked her about the whistleblower. Have you read the letter or statement that Shannon Norenberg submitted to this subcommittee? I have not read her statement. I am aware of the reporting of her concerns. I confirmed yesterday that the allegations that Shannon brought forward will be part of the IG investigation. I do want to note, Shannon has been an incredible employee for us. She's made an incredible difference as a sexual uh, assault uh, advisor at the Coast Guard Academy. Uh, We are a smaller organization with her departure, but the allegations she has made will be part of the IG investigation. You've seen public reports. Have you asked to see the document itself? I, I have not. This just came to light yesterday, but I have not seen her statement. Are you aware that as part of that report, she recounted that survivors were denied the opportunity to sign CG 6095. You're aware of that document, are you not? Yeah, I, so I am cooperating with the IG investigation. Well, I'm with talking about to those what in, you know. I don't, I, I do not know the specifics of her allegation. This is part of the investigation that will be done by the IG. I'm fully cooperating with the IG. And if there are, if there's evidence of misconduct, we'll work in accordance with law and policy to ensure well, accountability. Here's what, and I apologize for interrupting, but my time is limited. So I'm going to ask you, you know what CG 6095 is, right? It enables veterans of the Coast Guard to have access to benefits and care from the VA. When that document is unsigned, they can't access the benefits. If they're denied the opportunity to sign that document, not only are they victims of sexual assault and survivors, but they are prevented from accessing the health care they need to deal with the trauma and other medical problems that may be resulting from it. And I find one of the most damning parts of her letter to be that those survivors evidently were denied that opportunity. What are you going to do to give those veterans the opportunity to access care and benefits? I am committed to cooperating with the IG. We'll continue to work to understand what did or did not happen. Is the IG saying you can't give them the opportunity to sign CG? It it is an ongoing investigation, and the IG has said this is a mat. While it is under investigation, I cannot initiate action. As soon as we are able to, I will ensure that any victim who's entitled to veterans benefits has access to those benefits. This allegation just came forward yesterday, and we were working with the IG to understand uh, what just what happened, what didn't happen, and then we'll work to support victims. My priority is supporting victims. When will the IG investigation be done? Uh, uh, you'll have to ask the IG, sir. I you do don't not know. know. I don't know. I'm cooperating but with the IG. But in the meantime, survivors are denied medical care without any justification. I find that absolutely untenable and intolerable. And I think it will impact morale within the Coast Guard. Senator Richard Blumenthal, Democrat from Connecticut, questioning Admiral Linda Fagan, Coast Guard Commandant, 
at today's subcommittee hearing. You can find the video of the hearing in its entirety at our website, cspan.org. Thanks for listening to Washington Today. Subscribe to C-SPAN's free evening newsletter, Word for Word, and you get the stories making headlines in Washington sent to your inbox every day. Sign up at cspan.org slash connect. Have a good night.